last ride folks, I'm a 3D printer snob now too. So what's in today's episode? Well we're going to get on with uh, fabricating more parts for the Mixi Clock. Mixi Clock is a backlit digital clock in steampunk style. And today we're going to do some silver soldering of copper and brass parts, a little bit of machining, and we'll get part way through the fabrication of the dummy steam dome that goes on top of the clock. So uh, yeah, heaps of fun, so stand by. I have to be able to make uh, 12 of these fake pipe flanges and they're going to be machined so they either fit over the outside of that T or over the outside of the copper pipe that fits into the T. Now I've got to do 12 because there's three for each one of these T's and I've got four to do total. And I've set up my lathe, uh, this one's just a prototype, but I used it to actually work out all my offsets and the depths of the chamfers and so on. I marked that up on the drawing and I can go ahead and get these done very quickly. Now a lot of people are going to say, well gee that's not very original, uh, in a Victorian type boiler room all of those tees and flanges would be made from wrought iron or cast iron and then they would just be painted black or red. But the thing about steampunk is that it's not meant to be true to the original, it's like a caricature or it's as if uh, Victorian engineering was reimagined or repurposed. So often you'll see sort of facsimiles of that type of engineering project but they've been um, they've been shifted and reimagined like I say and often the materials that are used on steampunk type items is not what you would find in the original and as a child I remember reading these magazines that they were called Classics Illustrated we had a great big trunk full of them and my favorites were War of the Worlds uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Journey to the Center of the Earth and the thing was that they were beautifully illustrated in a, in a simple sort of way and it's the imagery that you would see in that Jules Verne story, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, that I believe influenced the steampunk movement. And uh, you know, what I'm trying to do here is to, to get that steampunk look without you know, trying to be dead true to the original. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get 12 of these knocked out fairly quickly. It won't take me long because I just, uh, I've got into the flow of it and I can get them done fairly quickly. So to do the, the boring on these flanges, I'm just going to put it in the ER40 chuck, uh, just leave it protruding slightly. And there's no guarantee that's running dead true. So I'm going to use the tail stock just to push it in. So I've got the jaws on my drill chuck extended just far enough to bear on the the face of that part. See how close we got that. Okay, it's good enough. So we're going to bore that now and I've got to have uh, one size that fits over the, the outer part of that T and the other one that fits over the actual copper pipe. Okay, all good. So I get that chamfered both sides and I'll just knock out the rest of them. Alright, 11 more to go. So for me to drill a pattern of holes in this pipe flange, the easiest way is to set it up in a collet block, in the vise, and I've got a three axis probe set up in its own dedicated horse taper holder. And I just keep this beside the machine so I don't have to keep swapping out the probe. Now, I bought the probe on eBay and uh, don't ask me <laughs> how much I paid for it or any of the details because I can't remember. And eBay doesn't keep your purchase history for more than three years now. But it's a nice little unit. And I'll just I'll run you through how I'm going to probe that part. But we'll get that in there. All right, we'll just jog over the hole now, and uh, we'll find the center. Okay, 
Just using a keyboard here, it's all back to front. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to show you the screen that I'm working from. We'll go from there. Okay, what I'm using here is Mac Standard Mill. Now, this is like a program that runs on top of Mac 3, but it has all these different options for probing. And there's a whole bunch of screens there that you can scroll through. And the one we're using today is this one here. If I click on that double green arrow there, it will actually probe in X and then Y and then X again and locate the exact center. If I click on this little uh, vertical arrow here, we'll actually probe the top surface, move over, and then locate the center. Uh, the one thing you have to do is actually give it some idea of how big the hole is. So you put in this diameter hint, which is a little bit bigger than the hole diameter that you're working with, and then it has some idea of how big the hole is and how far it has to probe. So we're going to click on this arrow here, and you'll hear the machine moving, and then we'll see what it's doing. That's done now and as you can see it's actually zeroed X and Y for me and interestingly it also gives you a readout on the diameter of that part so it's telling me that it's 14.8 millimeters or 14.8045 I just checked one of the other parts and it's showing up as 14.83 so it's accurate to within about 0 0.02 of a millimeter it's also configurable so you can calibrate the probe to take into account any overrun on the position of the switches inside the probe I've already done that and I don't mess with it now and it's uh, it's pretty accurate. I, I actually like it. Well, they're all done now, so it's got a lot of work to deburr all these holes. Not that it really matters. <laughs> Nobody's going to see it. But I'll get this one finished and I'll show you what it looks like as an assembly. And I wasn't going to do this originally. Um, I was just going to have the copper pipe joined straight at the T's. But I think you'll agree that that looks 100% better. Now none of this is uh, joined at the moment, it's just sort of all roughly assembled and it will need to be silver soldered later. The nuts and bolts here are 7BA, that's British Association, and uh, these can be bought with a smaller than usual hex head and nut, and it gives the correct scale appearance. So I'll get on and get the assembly done on those. Next step is to go ahead and cut the screw slot in these decorative screws. So let's get set up in the mill and do that. With these uh, little dome screws here, we've just got to put a screwdriver slot in this and uh, I bought a 1.2 millimeter wide slitting saw. That turned up a day after I finished the last video where I made these screws. <laughs> anyway, I'm putting these in a collet block and we've just got to set the slitting saw to the center of the screw head. And I've already zeroed in the y-axis, so the center of the cutter is directly in line with the center of this collet block. So all we've got to do here is bring the second saw. We'll bring the job over to the slitting saw. And just wind the knee up until we get pretty close. And all I'm going to do here is trap that feeler stock underneath the edge of the saw. And then I'm going to raise the knee and just rock that backwards and forwards. Okay, that's just touching there now. 
So I'm going to zero out the DRO and then we can offset by half the thickness of the saw blade and half the diameter of the screw head. Okay, with Z0 then we've got to come up by half the thickness of the blade which is 0.6 and half the diameter of the head which is uh, 16 or 8 on radius. So 8.6. Okay, there we go. Now just before I start this, I'm going to have to sort of just eyeball this step of cut because I want it to finish just before it hits the flat on the outside edge of the screw head. So it should come almost to the edge of the dome section of the screw. And uh, when I get there I can set uh, my DRO to zero on the X and then I should be able to just do all of the others at the same setting. camera was in the way there but I think I got that. Uh, there it is but I'll go ahead now and do the other three. So what will happen eventually is the copper pipe is going to fit in there. That will need to be silver soldered in place I think just to make that secure. Now my original thought was that the power supply coming in through this copper arm here would go through the donut, through the hollow centre of the screw and inside the clock. But thinking about it now, it means having to drill a hole in the screw and there's no guarantee the hole is going to line up when we assemble the screw. And of course once the copper pipe's in there, we're not going to be able to see very clearly what's going on. So I'm starting to rethink that idea. I'm now thinking that we're going to bring the power supply in through one of these braided stainless steel tubes and it will enter through the back of the clock through here and it's going to flex down to the, the base and attach that somehow. So it's going to be a much easier way of getting the power supply into the clock. And I think that's going to look nice and industrial. So. That's probably where we're going with that, but the next step in the build to this point is to build the dome that goes on the top of the clock case. So uh, let's have a look at the material that I've got for that. So what I've been able to find is a piece of chrome copper tube or copper pipe, and this was originally a downpipe from a bathroom sink. And it's just the right diameter, it's got a reasonable wall thickness, and it can fit on top of the wooden frame like that. But what it will need is a flange that fits over this curved surface here, another flange on top and a cover made from sheet brass. But the first step is to get that chrome off and I've already had a go at this end and I can tell you now it's not easy. Uh, that chrome is really hard and really thick. But we'll get that cleaned up, make it bare copper, we'll go from there. stuff is really persistent. <laughs> a few little patches there's one there strip round there but I'll make that the bottom that's going to be covered up by the flange
So what I've got here is a piece of aluminium stock in the three door chuck. It's been faced and the outer diameter there has been turned to the smallest diameter of the smallest piece that I have to do. And on the tail stock I've got a little aluminium gadget which I think I've shown you before. This is for pressure turning smaller parts. And I've got a piece of Delrin that fits over that again. And you just simply sandwich the brass disc between this aluminium stock and the Delrin. So on the back of the, the brass, I've just marked the diameter of this aluminium piece here, just so you can get it in the ballpark. And then you just basically squish the brass disc between the moving and the fixed part. So something like that. And you just spin that round by hand, just check that the corners are sort of more or less centered. And then you've got to make sure you put enough pressure on the tail stock to really keep that uh, squish between these two surfaces here. Okay, let's go ahead and get this one turned. So we're nearly circular now, so I'm just going to measure that and set my DRO and we'll hit that number. This is the disc that will go on the end of that copper tube there and uh, it's going to be hard for you to see but I'm going to use a knife tool to just sort of trepan out the face of that brass disc there so the copper tube can be located on that. And it's just for alignment so when we do the silver soldering it comes out concentric. I'm going to have to do some measuring here to get close to the dimension of the outside of that copper tube. Alright, that's it. So I'll just deburr that. It doesn't need to be very deep. It's, like I say, it's just for location. There's a sort of rough sandwich and that'll give you some idea of what it's going to look like on top. This will all be decoratively turned and radiused here later on. Get a little brass finial on there. It'll look cool. This brass strip here is to form the base of the dime. It has to be curved to fit over the radius of the timber frame. And you see in the drawing here that we've got a, a radius of 54 millimetres. But what I'll really do is just uh, keep rolling this till it fits over that, uh, that timber frame there. Now this might be a bit of a stretch for my little uh, jeweler's roll, but we'll see how we go. If it's no good, I'm going to have to anneal the brass. So uh, let's just keep winding that back roller in.
All right, so that's working. Um, this uh, jeweler's roll was one designed by George Thomas. It was uh, published in the Model Engineer magazine. And uh, I made this one here in the home shop. And it's great. Um, I loaned it to a friend a while ago and he, uh, <laughs> he cranked this handle so hard he broke it and I had to weld it back on again. But uh, it's, you know, for, for what I do, it's fine. Now, uh, if you're wondering why I've got so much of this, it's mainly because I've got to do two clocks, of course, but also having a much shorter piece, uh, it's sort of where it feeds into the roller, it doesn't actually start to curve till it gets to the back roller. And if you swap it end for end, it works, but it's better to have a bigger piece and cut it short. I'm just going to go and cut some of this end piece off so I don't have to lift the top roller out. Okay, I think that's pretty good. So now I need to cut off two pieces that in plan view at least are square. So in reality it'll be slightly longer on the circumference than it is in the width. And then we've got to set this up in the lathe and actually bore it out to fit over our piece of tube. So it's going to be mounted basically like that. And then we can finish turn the outer edge of the flange. So if I put my copper tube there and push it right up to the back edge and mark that off there. I've got that 16 millimeters. So I'm going to set my dividers to say 10. I want this to be just a fraction over size. So we're going to mark that at 10. And then I'm going to put the tube on there right against that mark and then sort of roll the tube and mark it off on the, the back edge. So that's our mark there. We'll add on 10, cut it to that size. So the, the actual cord distance this way should be the same as it is this way but the circumference measurement is going to be greater. And like I say, this is way oversized anyway, so even if I get this a little bit out, it doesn't matter. When we finish turn it, it's all going to come out circular and concentric with the tube. Well, that's been cut to size now, and you see it sits on that radius there. And I guess if you were totally lacking in self-respect, <laughs> you, uh, you could just make one of these and then bend it to fit the radius but it's going to shrink across that diameter there. And then when you fit your cylindrical part onto that, you're going to notice the difference in the, the width of the flange all the way around. So doing it this way is a lot more work, but you get a more consistent result when you're done. Now the, the next step is to bore out the hole in the center there to fit that tube. And uh, this is what's been keeping me awake at night. Uh, I think I'm going to be doing it on the milling machine.
joining these parts together I'm using silver solder and it's never easy because you get everything set up and you check everything for square and then you heat it up and things expand and move and so on so even though that's a fairly snug fit in there I want to ensure that it won't fall through when I heat it up and that's how I've got this one set up here so what I've been doing is getting a, um, a pair of side cutters like these and I'm just nicking the copper at two diametric points on that end so I just got the nipper set up there and you just sort of squish it and then roll it outwards and it raises a burr on the outside there don't know if you can see that but that will prevent that from falling through but then you still got no guarantee good thing this is a fairly rough and ready sort of <laughs> design uh, you know, steampunk's all about sort of getting an approximation, I guess. So I've got that little burr on both sides there now. I've cleaned these parts with a Scotch-Brite wheel and I can slide that through. I think, there it goes. And that sort of sits down there and won't go any further. So even if I heat that, it won't expand enough to allow it to fall through. So on the back here, I've just been checking with the square end of a rule to make sure I've got it, you know, square-ish. And we're going to get this one coated with flux. And we've got to get it up to a sort of a medium red heat. The important thing with any of the silver soldering is that your parts are absolutely clean and then you get a good coverage of the flux and then you've got to heat it quickly enough so that the flux doesn't just simply burn away. If you take your time getting the heat there, the flux will sort of uh, dry out and oxidise and there'll be nothing left and the brass and copper will oxidise too. And then you've got problems. I'm just putting a couple of short pieces of SBA 45, that's 45% 45 silver relatively low melting point and it flows very readily. So I'll put those there, heat that up, that'll sort of run downhill and flow all around that joint. Just had these parts uh, soaking in some dilute sulfuric acid and that removes all of the excess flux and the oxide on the copper and the brass. So these will clean up now in some water with some steel wool. Well, there are those parts now, having cleaned them up just with steel wool. And uh, this is just a superficial clean, we'll do the, the full polish later on. But what I need to do now is get rid of this excess copper underneath that curved flange there. Just going to do that on the contact wheel on the belt sander. You see that's almost completely cleaned up there now and I'm going to go on to the next operation but not on this video I'm afraid. <laughs> I think I've reached my half an hour limit. So let me get over to the bench, we'll do the wind up and yeah, we're finished for today. Well, there's a better view of the underside of that saddle there and you get a good idea here of how neatly that silver solar has formed that joint there. If you've done it correctly you should see just like a very thin sliver of the solar which is penetrated through the joint and uh, that means you got full coverage all the way around 
and it's uh, it's very very strong, way stronger than what I need for this application. And of course, that part will eventually sit on top of the wooden frame. It's going to be offset toward one side because there'll be another feature over here. And uh, what I'll do next, not on this video, but uh, I'm going to go and do it now. You see it on the next one. I'm going to drill a pattern of six holes around this curved flange here, and that will allow me to hold this down to the wooden frame with brass round head wood screws. Now I know some people are going to say, oh you can't do that, it's a boiler. Well it's not a boiler, it's a clock made to look like a boiler. And it's like somebody had taken a whole lot of uh, Victorian steam engineering technology and repurposed that and reassemble it and that's why I can use wood screws. And this, these are the parts uh, for the other dome. She's got to watch that. If that rolls off, I'm going to be in big trouble. Uh, here are the parts, and these are just machined but not put together yet. So there'll be another flange on top, and this is the cap, and it's all going to get silver soldered and drilled and reassembled. And you'll see that in the next episode. Uh, I'm sorry I can't do it now. I seem to have got out of sync with the making of the parts here. Uh, I sort of pick up in the middle of one part and leave off in the middle of the next one, but hey, what can you do? It's a half hour limit. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to say goodbye. Thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for sticking with this build. There's lots more to come. And uh, I love reading the comments. I'm starting to recognize a lot of people's names and their little, uh, what do you call them, like the little thumbnail pic that comes with it. And uh, I do try to answer all the comments as much as I can. And uh, I'll say goodbye now. Uh, please join me on the next episode with more parts for the Mixie Clock. Okay, thanks for watching.